the latest installment of Arts in the Pub. Today we're starting a, a brave conversation about arts and crime and our, our guest this evening is Benjamin Thorne. Benjamin has a, a wide background in the creative arts. As a composer, his music is published and performed around the world, including in major international events such as World Music Days. He composes both for virtuosic professionals and for educational contexts and has also prepared performing editions of Baroque and Renaissance works. He has performed and conducted workshops around Australia and in Europe. Uh, ben has two solo exhibitions as a collagist and printmaker and has created installations at the New England Regional Art Museum. He has directed a number of theatrical productions and has a particular interest in dramatising poetry on stage. He has worked as a TAFE teacher and as a researcher for the National Printing Industry Training Council, where he was responsible for the first graphic industry training package. He is the curator of the Museum of Printing at Nerham and the artistic director of the New England Buck Festival. Please uh, join me in welcoming Ben as he speaks about art on the edge of law. Well, what I was actually going to talk about is, uh, <laughs> is licit and illicit printing. And um, printing has always been a dangerous technology that needs to be controlled. In the early days of movable type, the issue was more about the transmission of subversive or heretical information. Before Gutenberg, who invented movable type in about 1450, there was printing in Europe. You could have wood blocks. And these are absolutely fantastic if you're producing playing cards or devotional images. They're not so good for the daily newspaper because by the time you've actually carved them all out, it's out of date. So unless you've got lots of big, long print runs and repeat business, wood blocks have their limitations. The great thing about movable type was that you could set up a page of type and prove the existence of God. You could then take it all to pieces, use exactly the same letters, reset it, and prove the non-existence of God. It wasn't a good career move. It could have rather unfortunate consequences if you did it, but it could be done. Which is why that very soon after the invention of movable type, we had the invention of censorship. Would anyone like to guess the name of the first banned book? The Bible, absolutely right. A German translation of the Bible. I think it was the fact that it was a translation that made, was made it controversial. If you control the means of production, you can control the product. The most obvious product of printing, of course, is ideas. And since these can be threatening, the way to control them is to control printing. In Australia, this meant that until the 1970s, you needed a license to own a printing press with movable type. Strangely enough, other printing processes weren't mentioned. It was movable type that was a dangerous one. So you could, you know, use offset screen printing, that was fine. Or even a Gestetner. Legislation didn't affect that at all, but printing with movable type was dangerous. And we do need to actually keep a bit of perspective here because when you think about it, most of the printing products of the printing industry aren't about ideas at all. They're things like packaging. More than 50% of the printing industry is packaging. These days in modern democracies, most governments are not too concerned with controlling ideas. As will be seen later, this is not true of all governments. There are still, however, some categories of printing that are controlled. Security printing is a category that covers things like money or things that can easily be converted into money, stamps, checks, and so on. And controlling money, the printing of money, is an international issue, since one way to subvert another country is to ruin its economy by pumping fake money into it. India and Pakistan, incidentally, constantly accuse each other of doing this. One of the most nefarious German schemes of World War II was to produce fake British five-pound notes to bring perfidious Albion to its knees. 
The forging was largely done by Jews in a rather special concentration camp. And by all reports, the forgeries were excellent, though not actually all that many of them made it to Britain. To avoid this sort of thing, there is an international register of currency printing presses and international agreements about whether when they are taken out of service, they have to be destroyed. As far as I know, there is only one X currency printing pr press in Australia that is still more or less together. It's in the Powerhouse Museum and was used to make print the last paper $5 notes. And even then, they had to get a special comp uh, dispensation to m keep the press. And it's even so, they weld, have had to weld some of the bearings together. I have actually seen this press. It's not on display. <laughs> it's hidden away out at um, Castle Hill in this storage. So what I'm going to do now is give you a quick overview of printing and counterfeiting money, how to do it, and so on, and then present some, some material from an oral history project that I'm involved in, where I've talked to people who have worked with counterfeiters or had done business with them. Firstly, someone who has worked with people responsible for the first major $10 note forgery case in 1967, uh, the ink manufacturer of another, another forgery case, and then, some, uh, then I'll, I'll finish off with some stories about from an, a Bible smuggler, an underground printer. Paper currency has been around for quite a long time. The Chinese first made it in, the six, in about the 600s, and it appeared, first appeared in Europe in 1660 in Sweden. The first notes were issued by individual banks, and this practice went on for several centuries. However, notes backed by the state also appeared in the late 17th century in France. For a bank note to be useful, it has to be durable and not easy to copy. The paper used for banknotes was, and still is in some countries, a tough starch paper made from 75% cotton and 25% linen fi fibres, and it weighs between 80 to 90 GSM. You can't actually buy it over the counter, for obvious reasons, and this is where most forgeries fall down, since fake notes just don't feel right. For instance, would someone like to do a little test for me? Who'd like to close their eyes? You close your eyes, Julie, and tell me which of these is the fake note. That one. Absolutely. Anyone else like to have a test? There you are. That's the photocopy. So it's really easy to tell. You know what money feels like. Even so, the average life Given a tough paper, the average life of a banknote in circulation is only about 18 months or less. Designs tend to be pretty elaborate to make copying difficult. Gravure printing tends to be used. Now, the commonest printing technique for most of the history of banknotes was letterpress. That is where you have a raised image, put ink on and take it off. Letterpress is not terribly useful for banknotes because you can't get it, the images complex enough. It's ideal for text, illustrations are tricky, and then you had to do those on, originally do those on wood blocks, and wood block painted money looks like monopoly money, so unless you're Chinese in Hong Kong, printing on one side of the paper, it's useless. And you generally cannot get fine enough complicated detail on a wood block for currency purposes. And wood blocks, you can't have a long enough print run. So instead, they used engraved plates using a gravure process where the image is recessed, and the ink goes into the holes, and then it gets into the, the gaps rather than on the surface. The other main printing process, lithography, which was invented in 1796, again, until about the 1960s, couldn't get sufficiently high level of detail and screen printing still cannot. Now, as well as the design, currency often includes a number of other security features. One of these is the metallic strip embedded in notes. And this can lead to all sorts of unintended uses. For instance, 
In Australia, on the old $2 notes, the metal strip tends to run down very close to the head of the sheep. And this led to an ex a, good, a popular sport in Australia called sheep racing, where everyone would pull out their $2 notes and see which one was further across the, across the, the finishing line. You can, if, you, if you have a look, you can see that those two that are in slightly different places. You can hold it as long as I get them back. <laughs> I've actually got a friend who, had a re who discovered that he had a really fast sheep where the metal strip goes back, right, right through the neck. So he kept that, in, he kept that carefully in his, one side of his pocket whenever he was short of money. He'd have bets with people. <laughs> <laughs> and he made a lot of money out of it. And he still got it. He, even though the $2 notes are <laughs> out, of, out of fashion, he still keeps his fast sheep. Other security features include magnetic inks and fluorescent inks that only show, uh, showed under ultraviolet light. And after the invention of plastic notes, you can have little holograms in them. Plastic notes, incidentally, make forgery a lot trickier. They date from about 1983. The first country adopting plastic notes were Costa Rica and Haiti. And Australia had its first ones in 1988. And in 1996, became the first country to have all denominations in plastic. So, how do you produce a good forgery? As I mentioned before, the hardest part is to get the paper that feels right. And when plas the plastic notes came in, a lot of people complained because they didn't feel like money. Other people complained because they'd accidentally ironed the notes and they'd shrunk. Of course, if you're in a country, if you're a country forging in other countries' money, you've got access to the right paper, but it's a bit of a problem for your common or garden criminal. Next problem, reproducing the design. Until the development of photo engraving in the middle of the 19th century, this was a major piece of skilled handwork. Even with photo engraving, a lot of hand retouching was required. Colour photocopiers, of course, changed all that. You know, looks like a perfectly good note. That's a colour photocopy. And it's, not actually, it's no coincidence that plastic banknotes came in at almost exactly the same time as cheap colour photocopies came in. Getting the colour right, of course, is also critical. In theory, you can reproduce any colour with a four-colour process colour. You shoot it through four, four different filters and print it with cyan, magenta, yellow and black. Bank notes tend not to use process colours, just to make the matching of the colour a little bit tricky. If the original is not printed using process colour, but you know what colours and how many colours of ink are used to print the note, you can adjust your filters to get the better reproduction. It takes a lot of skill and experience to do that, but will give you a better result. A forgery that reproduces the process used for the original will also always beat something which just reproduces the product. So you know, how you do it is often really important in making a good forgery. Banknotes also have individual serial numbers, and any reasonable forgery needs to have variable number numbering so that the game isn't given away by handing over a white pile of notes with the same number. And remember, the ideal forgery is one that is never discovered or even suspected. Another thing to think about is what denomination should we forge? Ideally, you want something of reasonable value, because after all, Copying, making a $100 note is just as difficult as making a, a $1 note. But you don't want it to be too big so because people look at those. They want something which is sort of common or garden. So in the 1970s, a $10 note was probably about right. These days, we've gone up, and there's a rumour going around town that there have been some fake $50 notes found in Armadale recently. So uh, that's, you know, it's gone up to 10, 20, and now $50 notes. 
Now, a few years ago, I interviewed an old printer called Paul Lynch. He'd worked for a while with some of the people involved in the last or the first major $10 note forgery case. This was at the Wilkie Group in Melbourne. Wilkies were one of the best quality printers in the country, printing things like Time Magazine and Reader's Digest. Here's Paul's version of the inside story of, the Wilk of that first $10 note forgery case. It was after I left the Wilkie Group that the people there got involved in the counterfeit $10 notes. That was the typical story of a gangster worming his way into a group, then producing a gun and threatening families and whatever they do whatever, if they didn't do what he said. Anyway, these characters were from Wilkie's used to go to the Monash Hotel after work drinking. And this gangster fellow found they were printers, and it's the old story. You can't print $10 notes, Dot Etcher bloke said. Cause we can, we know all about printing. Anyway, the gangster sucked them in, and he did the $10 notes. And they were good, they were very good fakes. Very good because the Dot Etcher bloke was one of the best Dot Etchers at Wilkie's. Anyway, they did the job, and they were caught out by a very astute policeman it was in a milk bar, bar down in Melbourne, and the shopkeeper said, gee, this note doesn't seem to be quite right. And he looked at it, went out, saw the car that the guy went away in, got the number plate, and it all unfolded from there. After that, there was a big court case, and the fellow who turned Queen's evidence disappeared off the face of the earth because he was under witness protection. They were heavy time crooks. But the worst part about it for the guy who did the etching job he resigned from Litho Colour, which was a Wilkie Group company doing reproduction work, and went on holidays in Queensland. And he hadn't told his family about all this, and it all unfolded while he was away. The police went out there and talked to the neighbours who said, oh, they're home Monday week or whatever it was, and they were on the doorstep when he came home. They'd already dug up the backyard and got $10,000 worth of counterfeit $10 notes. They'd paid him in counterfeit notes. <laughs> And he was going to start his own business. Of course, he started it up in Pentridge Prison down there. He did his time, came out of jail and did work freelancing. He was a pretty honest sort of bloke. <laughs> but these gangsters got behind him and threatened the family and everything. And he got $10,000 in counterfeit notes for the job. Sad, isn't it? <laughs> Harry Wallace of the ink manufacturer F.T. Wimble also had encounters with forgers. An American came into our factory in Rydalmere and he produced an American dollar bill. Incidentally, American dollar bills are what, American money is one of the easiest things in the world to counterfeit, as far as money goes. It's, someone has once calculated that there's, there's about 20% of the, of the US currency floating around the world is actually fake. <laughs> but you know, it's very simple colors and they're all the same. Anyway. He produced this and he said he was doing a promotional campaign and could we give him an ink that matched this as closely as possible? He didn't come through the normal sales size. The girl on the front desk had got one of our technical people in and he liked to challenge. Oh, of course we can match that. How much do you want? Oh, a couple of kilos. It's only for a promotional thing. When do you want it? Soon. So our technical person said, would three days time be okay? He said, yes, I'll come back and I'll pay cash. Of course, he was promoting himself and printing off American dollar bills. We had a visit from the federal police saying, we found this bloke raiding his premises. There's, here's a Wemble can. Why did you do this? Another story from Harry Wallace. I'd rung my, our machine man in Melbourne because he hadn't had any sales and he said he had a very good prospect. I said, who's this? And he said, it's a company up in Bendigo and they want this quite big press. I thought, that's strange in Bendigo. Perhaps Bendigo is close enough to Melbourne to justify that. He said, they're making a lot of money down there. They placed the order for the printing press, but they never got around to taking delivery of it because it turned out they'd been printing $20 bills. These were the old ones before we went to the new style. And in the way that people do in criminal stuff, they'd spent a lot of time and money to get this perfected with a numbering machine to do it so it wasn't all the same number on it. They loaded $300,000 worth of these and their idea was that they'd laundered these so they'd got all get mixed up rather than someone pick up all the that they had all this fresh money. So they went up to Eagle Farm Racetrack in Brisbane with a bootload of this money, four of them in the, four of them in the car, and they all took wads of this out and placed bets. And as you know, in placing bets, if you're careful, you know you're, not going, to, you're going to lose some, but you're not going to lose much if you put money on all the ones with four legs. So they did that, and they were very, very successful in laundering that, going back each race, laundering a bit more. They backed all that in the back of the car, very happy on the way back into New South Wales, 
and then they arrived at the tick gate. They used to have a tick gate up there to stop Queensland cattle ticks from coming down. And they stopped, and the bloke at the tick gate said, just want to check, can you open your boot? And they suddenly really realised they had all this money in the boot. <laughs> because there's no tick gate going into Queensland, and they'd never done the full round trip. So they panicked and sped off, and of course the bloke on the tick gate phoned the police and said, there's something suspicious going on, and of course they were picked up a bit further down the road. That's when I realised that my salesman was telling me that these people were making money. It was the full, literal sense that they were. <laughs> I'm not sure I took a lot of pride in knowing that our product had, to, had been very good, good enough to pass the eyes of lots of people looking at the money. Wimbles did, however, also do its bit in trying to prevent fraud. One of the things that Wimbles did was produce security inks for bank checks and the like. Probably 30 years ago, one of the pen companies produced a pen called, I think it was called a Playmate, something like that. And on the back, like you sometimes get with pencils, it had a rubber, an eraser as the Americans call it. The idea behind this was that if you made a mistake, you then used the eraser that wiped it out and you corrected it and off you went. No scratch marks or eraser marks. So it didn't take long for Australian entrepreneurs, and we've always been good at producing con men here. It didn't take long for them to realise, if I've got a cheque that's come from the tax office or elsewhere that says $300, I could easily change the 100 to 1,000 or whatever, and then I've made a killing on it. So the banks suddenly discovered there were all these altered cheques coming in. So they had a great scramble for us to produce an ink that they could print the cheques with, so that if the chemical in this eraser was present, it suddenly made all brown, and it was obvious it had been tampered with. Before we leave the subject of forgery, it might be worth thinking about why other security printing products are not as attractive to forgers. Postage stamps, for instance. Obviously, any company printing postage stamps is going to be careful that their workers don't walk off with a few spare sheets of stamps. But basically, the amount of money involved is chicken feed. Also, while you can easy, fairly easily print your own stamps, the ability to convert them into cash is limited. Forgery and stamps is likely to be not so much for mailing as for philatelic purposes, reproducing a rare stamp that potentially is worth thousands of dollars to a collector. Faking printed check forms and share and security certificates had a limited scope last century, but in both cases the printing was only part of the forging process. Most check forging actually involves forging the writing on them. The reason that checks have elaborate designs is that it's hard to fiddle with what has been written on them. Erasing dollars on a cheque for $5 to substitute $5,000 is likely to also erase part of the fancy background and give the game away. Technological advances and procedures have made forgeries of printed cheque forms and security activities fairly pointless. Incidentally, on the subject of cheques, it's not always been necessary to use a printed or authorised form. In England, it was legally possible to write a cheque on the side of a cow. Though this has probably only been done once by punch in a five pound check to author A.P. Herbert, who discussed this legal anomaly in a book on the quirks of British law. Here's a picture of him cashing it. <laughs> you can pass that around too. Another area of forgery that linked to historical postage stamps is producing documents of historical interest or importance. The contents may or may not accurately reflect the originals, depending on whether your aim is to make money from a newly discovered copy of a known document or you want to rewrite history. In either case, the issues of matching the paper, inks and typefaces to the period. The same things apply to forged manuscripts like the Hitler diaries, where the ink didn't match. One of the best sources of paper for forged documents are blank pages of books from the time. And for ink, you need to make use it the old recipes. And also, when you're printing, find an original font. Also, use the original technology. As I said before, if you use the, the old process, it'll make a much better forgery than some other one. Forgeries have been detected because they could not have been produced by the technology of the time. One example I've read about was a document dating from the time of the American War of Independence. How it was detected, it had been created with a letter set font that matched a period font, but the person who put it all together, can any of you remember letter set? 
it was that you were probably all old enough to remember Letra Set, all these little rub on letters. But what he managed to do was get a couple of lines, the, the, the ascenders overset, overlap the ascenders. And that's one thing that cannot happen in letterpress printing because your lines have to be completely separate. So that was how that, that one was. I mean, they'd made the relief block, but it just couldn't have been done in the original way. Mm -hmm.